Welcome. My name is Daniel Piano, and I'm originally from South Africa. But now I'm currently living here in Milan and attending the American School of Milan. Today, in the world, 800 million people are going to bed hungry every night, and probably billions more are not consuming a healthy diet. Using technology, we cannot just focus on getting more food, but we can assure that it is the right food to fit an individual's needs. This might mean that in the future, the cafeteria at my school, using data gathered by your smartphone or watch, for example, can prepare individualized food for each student at lunch so that everyone's meal is personalized to give them the right nutrients they need for that day. This could be really beneficial if I had a soccer match in the afternoon and I receive a personalized meal containing the right carbohydrates I need in order to perform at my peak. Um, through the use of personalization and with the help of technology, tracking and gathering information and better AI in the kitchen has the potential of leading us to a brighter future with healthier and more efficient food usage. I am thoroughly looking forward to what the experts have to say on this very interesting topic. Thank you. So this topic is one of my personal favorites, the future of nutrition. Because I think today we're all bombarded with different ideas of what is healthy. You know, is vegan the right diet or paleo? Coffee's good for you. No, coffee causes cancer. And I think all this confusion is leading a lot of consumers unsure of what to do and possibly leading to our obesity epidemic. So the big question now is, what is the future of nutrition? Can scientists tell what the perfect diet is? Is there universal healthy food? What's good for me might not be good for you. So that's the big, big, the big debate here, and I hope we find a solution. Thank you. Mi chiamo Roberta Schira e, e sono qui perché faccio un lavoro strano, ma un lavoro importante, vado al ristorante. Avete presente? Per capire, ve li assumo in pochissimo quello che faccio nella vita, ho scritto una dozzina di libri, sono critto gastronomico per il Corriere della Sera, ma avete presente quando Robert De Niro torna dopo 15 anni e boh gli chiede cosa hai fatto in tutti questi anni? Sono andata a letto presto, io sono andata al ristorante. Quindi direte, cosa c'entra il ristorante con eh, i temi importanti di eh, Seed and Chips? C'entra, c'entra perché vi do soltanto due dati. Eh, in Italia, prima in Italia perché siamo qua, poi vi do un altro dato estero, noi spendiamo, abbiamo speso nel 2017 83 miliardi per mangiare fuori, un, più, per, un 3% in più dell'anno prima. Non solo, interessante questo dato, anche eh, collegandolo al fatto che abbiamo speso meno per fare la spesa. In, negli Stati Uniti eh, sfioriamo gli 800 miliardi. Quindi io mi sono chiesta, sto preparando un libro esattamente su questo, il mio quattordicesimo, ma è vero che è importante il legislatore, è importante il governo, è importante l'agricoltura, è importantissimo il clima, è importante l'acqua, ma se noi non convinciamo i ristoratori, i produttori, i proprietari di catene di ristoranti, non soltanto il ristorante Fandani, ma il ristorante da, eh, che fa un hamburger a 2 dollari, lo convinciamo che lui può veramente avere un ruolo fondamentale nel cambiare il pianeta, non serve a niente. Serve o perlomeno serve tantissimo parlare con i ragazzi, parlare con le scuole, parlare con tutti, ma in realtà è il proprietario di una catena che deve decidere quante tonnellate di carne comprare da allevamenti intensivi. Quindi la ristorazione è importantissima. Quindi noi abbiamo sempre più eh, homo restauranticus in giro intorno a noi, sempre meno gente compra per cucinare in casa, nonostante i mercati editoriali, i programmi televisivi, e sempre più gente mangia fuori, per strada, l'hamburger, il grande ristorante in generale. Questo è un dato molto importante. Ehm, quindi io sono qui, come tutti gli altri, per dare una visione positiva. La mia visione è quella del ristorante perfetto. Adesso in quattro punti brevissimi ho sintetizzato qual è, secondo me, il ristorante del futuro, come dovrebbe essere, come sta già, eh, succedendo in, in, grandi, in molti paesi del mondo. Allora, fino a qualche mese fa era molto di moda, fino all'anno scorso, 
per il chef farsi fotografare in due metri quadri di orto e dicendo ah, io sono uno chef etico, io sono uno chef attento alla sostenibilità perché coltivo due metri quadrati di, di erbe aromatiche. Uh, non basta. La prima cosa è attenzione alle persone. È inutile che io vi faccia il mio orto biologico che tutti sappiamo che non può eh, sostentare una cucina con 100 coperti quando sono aggressivo, per esempio, con la brigata quando sfrutto le persone che lavorano con me al ristorante. Quindi il eh, ristorante sostenibile ed etico deve fare attenzione alle persone. Eh, è vero, first water, ma anche first people. Deve, eh, un ristorante sostenibile o un imprenditore della ristorazione deve stare attento alla formazione, deve stare attento a scegliere produttori che sono coerenti con la sua filosofia di vita. È inutile che io dico sono un ristorante che vuole fare un discorso di sostenibilità e poi vado a scegliere appunto della carne eh, che arriva da, eh, oppure un animale che è stato alimentato in modo errato. Ancora, attenzione ai eh, consumi, quindi consumi energetici, questo è un punto fondamentale. Eh, ho scoperto che tra tutte le imprese possibili, l'impresa che ha il maggior consumo energetico a metro quadro è il ristorante, il bar e le mense. Quindi questo vorrebbe farci capire come è importante per un imprenditore della ristorazione eh, trovare la collaborazione di, delle società che vanno in controllo sui consumi. Ci sono delle società, delle app che vanno a controllare, per esempio di notte, quando i ristoranti sono chiusi, se c'è un consumo, se c'è una perdita. Quindi molta attenzione a quello. E ancora, ehm, terzo punto, attenzione ai rifiuti e agli sprechi. C'è un'associazione che si chiama, ehm, un'associazione che premia i migliori ristoranti sostenibili al mondo e, e che è molto attenta a questo. E uno di questi ristoranti che, eh, che ha vinto l'anno scorso è il ristorante di Christian Puglisi, che è in Danimarca, e ha vinto proprio per la sua capacità di, stare di fare molta attenzione al riciclo e ai rifiuti. Il caffè, per esempio, che viene, i fondi di caffè diventano eh, fertilizzanti. Ancora, i piatti rotti, per esempio c'è un altro ristorante a Tokyo, che i piatti rotti vengono ehm, riparati con un'antica tecnica giapponese e riutilizzati. Le ossa degli animali vengono, per i ristoranti che ancora utilizzano, um, hanno nelle loro carte la carne, o degli animali, vengono utilizzati come utensili della cucina. E ancora il sughero, per esempio il sughero di tappi, c'è un'applicazione un interessante, molto più famosa nel, nel, nel Regno Unito, che si chiama Recorker, che re, eh, recupera questo, questo, questo sughero e lo rivende o lo regala in beneficenza. Addirittura le uniformi, le uniformi possono essere fatte eh, riutilizzando del vetro eh, ormai già smaltito. L'ultima cosa importantissima, attenzione alle materie prime. La terza via, che è quella di cui io mi sto occupando, che uscirà nel mio prossimo libro, è questa. Less meat, better meat. Quindi voglio sapere, quando mangio un pezzo di carne, ne mangerò meno, ma come ha vissuto quell'animale? Come ha vissuto, cosa ha mangiato, che cosa e come è morto? Questo è fondamentale. Proprio perché abbiamo visto prima che impatto veramente economico immenso che ha la scelta dei ristoratori e dei eh, proprietari di catene di ristoranti. Ancora, più vegetali ovviamente, più cibo organico, più attenzione alla, bio alla biodiversità, è inutile che vado a comprare un cibo dall'altra parte del mondo quando magari se mi guardo intorno ci sono dei produttori che, fanno delle cose, che producono eh, prodotti utili e interessanti. Quindi, notuna, quindi anche il pesce come la carne eh, è a rischio. Quindi io devo prediligere un ristorante che in carta ha meno carne e ha meno pesce. Che dire, ho finito? Domanda un po' e osservazione un po' ehm, provocatoria. Non sarà che il futuro del mondo e della nutrizione si gioca al tavolo di un ristorante? Grazie. Buongiorno. Hello. Greetings from New York. I'm going to do it in English. Okay? All right. All right. Roberto, I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with you, so I'm going to do it in English. Um, it is a true honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. 
I am going to talk about the connection between food and healing. Um, yes, I am a doctor. Yes, I am a chef in training. So today I'd like to talk to you about the fact that I simply believe that the future of medicine is food. Food is the future of medicine. You know, if you remember back in the day, before we had medicines, you know what people were treated with? Food, right? So if you look at traditional cultures, the first healing occurred in the kitchen, usually by the mother or the grandmother, and they served you food. That is why chicken soup has stayed, the time, has stayed around for a long time. And actually did a study on chicken soup a couple years ago. What's fascinating about chicken soup is that all the vegetables that go into the chicken soup are the healthy. The chicken is the unhealthiest part of the chicken soup. So as a doctor, I get asked this question over and over and over again. So doc, what should I eat? Now, I want you to take time in your life and think about what would your doctor tell you? How often have you told your doctor? Do you go to your doctor and ask him what food to eat? Because anyone ever asked their doctor what I should eat? So this is a very common question I get. And unfortunately, many people don't go to the doctor and talk about food, or this fact is true. Your doctor says he doesn't know enough about nutrition or exercise. They just are not taught this. So I'm not telling that it's the doctor's fault. I'm thinking it's the bigger problem. It's the medical education system. You do what you're taught, just like anything in life. So if you're not taught about nutrition, you're not gonna prescribe food as medicine. Right? You're taught how to manage diseases. You're not taught how to cure diseases. You're not taught how to cure diseases through food. And in fact, nutrition is not recommended in most medical education systems. And in fact, I, when I went to medical school not too long ago, I only got two hours worth of nutrition in medical school. You put together my, my fellowship training in internal medicine, primary care. I did a fellowship in nutrition, I mean, in integrative medicine. My colleagues in cardiology, endocrinology, gastroenterology get no education in nutrition. So should you be going to your doctor to talk about nutrition? Maybe he's not the right person. But what we do know what to do is to give out these. These are beautiful in a painting. But in fact, in America, seven out of 10 Americans take one or more prescription drugs each year. 50 million prescriptions are filled annually. 50 million prescriptions are filled annually. And this is one of my biggest problems I have in our society. So one in three hospitals, one in three children's hospitals have a fast food restaurant in it. So think about that. You're feeding the people that work there and also the parents and sometimes the children up on upstairs, the food from McDonald's. Wendell Berry said it best a couple years ago. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. Crazy, right? This is why we have this problem. One in five deaths in the world, that means one in five deaths in the world are linked to diet. This is a recent study just this year in The Lancet. Among all forms of malnutrition, poor dietary habits, particularly low intake of healthy foods, is a leading risk factor for mortality. Food will kill you. One in five people die each day from food-borne illnesses. And this is one of my favorite quotes by Albert Einstein. Insanity is doing the same thing over again and over again and expecting different results. I think we should actually start thinking differently. Why? Because one study like this one says, 80% of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, and 70% of cancer are prevented by not smoking, by exercising, managing stress, and eating a healthy diet. So just think about what I just showed you. One in five people die from an unhealthy habit, but yet 80% can be prevented by adopting a healthy lifestyle. And this is not a new concept. I say, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm just a new messenger of an old concept. In 431 BC, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Now we all know that medicine is slow to evolve, but I think 2000 years 
I think it's about time we change. So I and my wife had this idea. What if we gave people the idea that we can actually help prevent and cure diseases by prescribing food? But we can't do that alone. And always, multidisciplinary, we're just speaking to someone that's going to be speaking later. You can't do this alone. The medical community and the food community have to join up together. We got to get McDonald's out of hospitals. We got to get fast food out of hospitals. We got to start feeding people healthy food. So in 2010, this simple concept, what if I started writing prescriptions for patients, for patients, would they eat healthy meals, particularly whole food plant-based diets? And in fact, studies have shown that if a doctor prescribes healthy food to their patient, they're more likely to adhere it. And in 2010, same, same year, we had another idea. What if we took doctors out of the hospital and took them into the kitchen to teach them how to cook healthy food? Would they now be able to talk to their patients about healthy food and healthy living? And in fact, it was covered in the Wall Street Journal. And so I'm going to share with you in the next couple of slides, really quickly, my story. So these are doctors that work typically in the hospital, long shifts, and they take them out of the hospital and into the kitchen at the Natural Gourmet Institute in New York City on Monday to support Meatless Mondays. And in fact, these are more students. We've done this, we did this eight times until, what do you think happened? Funding stopped. I personally think it's a ridiculous thing that we cannot support teaching doctors the same way we teach doctors about medicines, we should teach them about food. And of course, we pair it with vino, right? Vino is plant-based, so we always include that into our meal plans. And this is just a simple selfie that we took cooking with doctors. And then they got, the hospitals started getting jealous. And so we ended up inviting many of the hospital chefs to teach them how to cook whole food plant-based diets as well. So as you can see, I used to work for a health system, which we, at one point, a couple years later, didn't see eye to eye on things. Because I felt that the best medicine is the one you don't need. Preventing the disease is the best cure. And then we had another idea. Because one thing, at least in the US, our food and our hospitals are horrible. Is the food good here in Italy? Men's amends, huh? So we had this idea. If you grow it, you eat it. And we met some resistance, of course, right? So this was a rooftop at our garden in, a, in Lenox Hill Hospital. Most people don't know Lenox Hill, but they know who had a baby there. Beyonce had her baby at Lenox Hill Hospital. So this was an abandoned rooftop. We turned that into this. And now doctors, nurses, engineering, everybody goes out there and hangs out on the rooftop. As you can see on the bottom, bottom right here, it's a chef. So we also had this idea, and I'll show you in a couple of slides. We start using some of the vegetables and fruits that we grow on top and bring them into the kitchen. And in fact, anytime you're in New York, although I am no longer there, the legacy stays. They still have the rooftop garden at Lenox Hill Hospital. And see, there's some more pictures. As you can see, it becomes very busy. One of the biggest problems we had, talking about garbage here, they didn't have enough garbage cans up there. We had this idea, most people don't realize that doctors and nurses and healthcare workers are very stressed out, so we put rocking chairs upstairs. And my favorite thing is seeing that. So a healthcare worker taking a break on a, on a rocking chair. I teach about plant medicine, herbal medicine. As you can see, these are a group of medical students learning where our medicines originate from. Again, 80% of medicines originate from plants. This is our, one of our favorite restaurants. This is the Candle Cafe family in New York City. If you go to Candle Cafe, if you're ever in New York City, you go to Candle, you say Dr. Graham's Greens, Dr. Graham, they get 10% discounts. And Edible, Manha Edible Manhattan came to cover this as well. As you can see, these are peppers, tomatoes, sage, these, that right there is the beautiful Swiss chard that we actually took out off the rooftop 
and into the patient's rooms. And you can see Giuseppe Basil. What do you do with Giuseppe Basil? You make margarita pizza. And again, this gentleman, this was a chef before, this is a chef after. He's an Italian. And every day he would go up there and make fresh food using the fresh herbs from the garden. And in 2015, the year before I left, and Carly came and visited us as well, 20,000 people visited Victory Greens. But I wasn't done yet because I got some love, but I didn't get a lot of love. So I started thinking, how can I get more love in the food world to bring it into medicine? Everybody loves chefs. So I said, why don't I become a chef? And so I enrolled last August into chef training. These are my classmates now. I am known as the grandfather there because some of them are 20 years old. And last week, last Sunday, Saturday, I did my first buffet. And of course, this is me on set, Meatless Monday. We did a video for them, teaching them how to um, cook a quinoa rice bowl. And I just want to share with you in the last two minutes what we've been able to do. So, you know when until you have a cartoon. So now I have a cartoon character. We started a, a new field in medicine called culinary medicine, the intersection between the culinary arts and the science of medicine. And now dozens of schools and medical schools are using culinary medicine. My friend Tim Harlan down in Tulane, New Orleans, is a colleague of mine. You're starting to see now more and more gardens. Boston Medical Center started this beautiful big rooftop. Again, planting the seed of an idea. Now we have pharmacies and hospitals. And they're actually hiring Michelin star chefs to go cook in hospital food. Now just imagine one more idea that I have for you. Imagine that is the new pill. Okay, imagine this is an idea that I have now that I'm working with. Why becoming a chef? Nutrition for your condition. Medical meal kits, meals and kits prescribed, designed, and delivered to your house. How many times have you heard, and I know this lovely woman that's going to come talk to you later about diabetes, heart disease, cancer. You get diagnosed with something. The quickest question, you start from the beginning of the talk. So, Doc, what should I eat? People don't know what to eat when they get out of the hospital with a heart attack. So this is my idea. This is what I would love to work with you in the food world. Develop kits if you want to cook, and if you don't have time to cook, prepare meals designed for your medical condition. This is my new hashtag, Chef the Medicine. Danny Nuremberg, I don't know if you're here, but this is one of my favorite quotes at a food tank. We can't do this alone. We need everybody at the table because together we are building a better food system. And now let me end with this. We need a fresh start in medicine. This is why we designed fresh medicine. It's five things you have to do. You have to f food, relaxation, exercise, sleep, and happiness. Those are the best medicine. I firmly believe that the future of medicine is in food and the best medicine is made in your kitchen. This is our motto and I like to end with this. When it comes to health, it all starts with food. But at the end of the day, what we truly want in life is to be happy and with one second left, I am very happy. Thank you so much. I love coming back to Seeds and Ships because I love hanging out with visionary doers. Obviously, I go to a, a lot of conferences and a lot of conferences where there's a lot of talk. But here, you can really taste the future, which I love. To be honest, I'm not a tech person. I actually, I'm not a food a foodie either. I can hardly cook. I'm a medical doctor uh, by profession and an environmentalist at heart. But I love food because I believe it's the most powerful vehicle to create a better world. So, Robert Graham, we need more doctors like you. But I believe the recipe for change can be summarized in three C's. Connections, consensus, and collaboration. So let's start with collaboration. No, <laughs> sorry, let's start with connections. Food connects human health to the health of the planet. Right now, it's in 
all the wrong ways, and it's really a broken system. First, food is our biggest environmental challenge. One third of all the greenhouse gas emissions is coming from the food system. And food is also our biggest global health challenge. If we take into account all the people that are getting too little, too much, or the wrong types of food, as much as one out of three people on the planet is malnourished. And food, or poor diets, is now a bigger threat to human health than alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and unsafe sex combined. With business as usual, this is going to be much worse. With another two billion mouths to feed by 2050, and more people eating more like us in the West, meat-heavy, ultra-processed diets. Still, governments around the world, they are not only keeping up producing what makes us sick and what destroys the planet. No, they are even subsidizing it with billions of dollars every year. Quite crazy, right? So the whole food system is broken, and there is no way that single efforts and siloed solutions will fix it. So the only way to get it right on food and for us to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement is by looking uh, into the big picture and start addressing the root causes and develop holistic solutions that are actually good for people and planet. But the good news is, though, what tends to be good for people tends to be good for the planet, and vice versa. So studies show that if we shifted to healthy diets from sustainable production systems, we could switch food from being a driver of all these challenges to becoming the solution to tackle and even prevent them, just like he said. In fact, a study from Oxford from 2016 showed that if the world shifted to a healthy plant-based diet, we could save millions of lives, trillions of dollars, and cut food-related emissions with as much as 70%. So, policymakers and business people, they are actually starting to get it. They understand that we have to change. But in order for us to create the food revolution we need, we need consumers, or we need us people on board. Because although most world leaders actually know what to do, with a few exceptions, at least in the US, because they know what to do, they don't know how to get re-elected or make profit once they have done it. But by unlocking the power of the plate, as I'm calling it, we can create this global movement. Because food also connects all these global challenges to our everyday sort of individual choices. So what we put on our plates is actually the most important we do for our own health and for the health of the planet. And if or when tasty, affordable uh, alternatives exist or become available, we can actually, it's much more appealing and rewarding for most people to change their diets and do something they actually want to, to eat than to park their cars or start fighting for a new power grid. And the beauty of food is that because literally everyone, even Trump, cares about food, we have potentially billions of people that can vote for a better world and better health every time they sit down to eat. Food also connects people, obviously. Families, friends, bringing people together. But it also connects agendas. Because of all the interlinks, and because food is such a common denominator for so much, we have the opportunity to bring a wide range of stakeholders together across sectors, disciplines, and borders, and get them to collaborate towards a joint vision. Food that is better for people and better for the planet. But the tiny little question, which is kind of important, what is that? That brings us to the second C, which is consensus. In order for us to mobilize global action, it's pretty obvious, right? 
we know, <laughs> we have to agree on where we are heading. The Paris Climate Agreement was an international landmark agreement. So what made it possible was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, assessing the research and putting forward a science-based target, the less than two degree Celsius global warming, that all the 195 countries could get behind and sign up for. Currently, there is no IPCC for food. Therefore, it's no consensus and no science-based targets for how to provide healthy diets to the world in a sustainable way either. So that is why my organization EAT, together with the medical journal The Lancet, uh, have set up the EAT Lancet Commission on Food Planet Health. And the objective of that commission is to create a defining framework. What constitutes healthy diets from sustainable food systems? So for the past two years, 20 of the world leading scientists in agriculture, health, nutrition, food policy, environmental sciences, and so on, have been working to assess and synthesize the existing evidence, what's already out there, and trying to define initial scientific targets on what the food system will have to look like in order to meet the sustainable development goals and deliver on the Paris Climate Agreement. So all of the report is not out yet. It won't be published before later this year. I can share the main headlines with you. And the good news is that it is actually possible to feed everyone on the planet a healthy diet in a sustainable way. But the not so good news is that it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to require the unprecedented global coordination and collaboration something the world has never seen before. Paris is going to be easy compared to this. So in addition to doing what we are already talking a lot about, to dramatically reduce food wastes and losses, and start producing more <coughs> or increasing yield in a sustainable way, we will have to start sharing and recycling nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Phosphorus is turning out to be really hard. And we also need to strictly manage land and oceans, meaning no further environmental harm or biodiversity loss coming from food production. And last but not least, and maybe hardest, we will need to see a global shift to almost exclusively plant-based or alternative protein diets. It's important to say that this report is obviously not the final answer. One report, is literally not answering anything. But this is a first critical step towards building consensus and setting the science-based targets that the world can agree upon for a food system that deliver for people and planet. Much more research is going to be needed and we are already working on setting up a synthesis center to bring the research together. But the commission is already, before even uh, being published, is already creating a lot of new conversation. What will this mean for policymakers? What is it going to mean for business? And what about investors, entrepreneurs? What is it going to mean for chefs, for civil society? And obviously, how do we get consumers or us to buy into this? And last but not least, how do we coordinate? the efforts that are needed to take us to this grand transformation we are talking about. And that's where we are coming to my last C, which is collaboration. Collaboration across borders, across disciplines, and across sectors. Obviously, technology must and will play a vital part in this great transformation. And digitalization and disruptive technologies like we are seeing here, is already literally changing the conversation. But we have to remember that tech is just a tool. And tech as a tool is so much more powerful if it's not only addressing siloed issues, like finding a cure for diabetes. But 
it's so much more powerful if it's really looking into the systemic challenges and underlying root causes, such as avoiding people from get getting diabetes in the first place, right? Because like Einstein said, you know, doctors, they tend to be very fan of Einstein quotes. But Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, but geniuses prevent them. And that we need to start picking up on. But to unlock the full potential of tech and innovation, we need not only entrepreneurs and smart tech geeks looking into the big picture and taking on root causes as a challenge. We obviously also need enabling policies and mechanisms to bring this up at scale. But however, as it's no mechanism to bring the science together, it might not be a surprise that there is no mechanism or global governance mechanism to bring stakeholders together and make and member states and make them uh, drive progress through commitments and so on. So to use the climate analogy, there is no COP meetings for food. So that's why I started EAT five years ago to create a science-led neutral platform or arena for business, science, policy and civil society leaders to come together and take on the big picture approach and collaborate to speed up the transformation to a better food system for all. So through our work, we see that by aligning agendas, environmental, health, economic and social, powerful alliances form and new potent opportunities arise. And when brilliant tech geeks start focusing on tackling the root causes and fixing broken systems, not only broken things, well, then our minds are literally the limits. So that's why we are so proud and excited to partner up with citizenships and why I've been counting down days to coming here and tasting the new solutions and meeting new inspiring people. Because like Marco has shown, uh, shown us by inviting us into the big, happy Italian citizenships family, it's the that <coughs> the key to success is very much like food itself. Magic things happen when people gather around the table. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shan Shan. I'm a co-founder of Cooking Company Limited, and uh, really glad to see all of you here in Season and Chips. Very great honor to speaking on this stage as well with all those uh, amazing speakers. And today, I want to introduce you to a solution that we have developed called Mucho, and how personalized grocery shopping is a crucial part in nutrition. Before I start, I want to give you a little bit of background about us. So here is my co-founder, Juliana and I. Both of us grew up in very strong food cultures, and back then, choosing what to eat didn't seem like a such difficult choice. But as we grow up, go to the board and study, we noticed that people are paying more and more attention to food. And noticeably, among millennials, People spend roughly four hours every week just on browsing recipes and photo, uh, photos of other people's dinner on social media. And that doesn't even include watching TV shows on the telly or doing recipe researches for themselves. And it haunts us because it seems like the more attention we pay to food, the less happy people have become. And that got us thinking and find out why. Both of us are have a social science background. So we looked at it from a macro level and categorized all these challenges into three categories. And you might disagree, but hear me out. 
Uh, first, we identified diets and nutritional information uh, is one of the issues that's causing it because there's so many of them. And whether it's self-identified or not, if it's a trans or a fab, it is very difficult to translate all those principles into the actual dinner, meat, breakfast or lunch we eat day in and day out. And receiving a dietary uh, plan or getting a sample recipes is not going to take you very far because eating, cultivating a good habit, it takes time. And more than often, people find this process very daunting. Of course, you can do it yourself, but the amount of time you need to spend on gathering information is just not an easy ask. And Asking for professional help, more than often, not everybody can afford that. And finally, when it comes to the supermarket, it's very difficult, again, because there's so many products on the shelf. There's thousands and thousands of the SKUs, and where is the time for you to read the label and compare the foods you are going to put in your basket? And our assessment is also confirmed by a lot of the consumer research. Personal shopping is not a fancy way people associate with buying fashion items anymore. 79% of the shoppers says they want a personalized shopping experience as well. And uh, there's so many hurdles of deciding what to buy or which food to buy. For two out of five shopping baskets is abandoned and one in three of us admit that choosing what to cook is the least enjoyable part of the cooking experience. And this is why we created Mucho. We want to build a solution to help people eat better. In a nutshell, here is what we have done. It's a personal food shopping experience in an ecosystem that brings together products, recipe content, consumer requirement, and commerce. In the back end, Mucho use machine learning that analyze all the products from the retailers and process consumers' needs, requirements, or preferences, present recommendation in the form of recipe, give them the ability to add all the ingredients they needed for that particular recipe to their basket in one go. And this process tackles all the three issues I've identified earlier. And by doing so, all those guidelines for, in, for nutritional diet and all of them are become a tangible products in the consumer's basket and ready to be cooked at home and enjoyed with family and friends. So here is a closer look of what we have done. We build a fully flexible system that can accommodate changing habits, diets, budget, allergies, and things that matters to people. We help people to discover recipes and products all of them are chosen just for this person. And we use machine learning to understand their preferences, their habits, their history, to better our recommendation each time when they come back to us. When it comes to order, we understand buying food is a practical matter. People want to optimize the ingredients usage across different multiple recipes, and we add just the right product to the basket to check out. And once they receive the, all the grocery, they can follow the step-by-step -step instructions on the app and tell us what they, uh, how they cooked it. And with that, we can track what they have done. So now we know what they have bought, what they have cooked at home, how they have used it. We know what is the leftover. We can give them better recommendation to reduce waste when they come back to us the second time. So we received a lot of help on the journey and uh, from retailers and food writers. Last year, the best British supermarket brand, Waitrose, opened its doors to us. And during the time we were there, we delivered 
a dinner for tonight proposition for people, help them to make very snappy dinner choices on the go, and then they can pick up the grocery inside the store on demand. We work with a lot of, lot of recipe writers. They're so passionate. They want to see people cooking their dishes at home and enjoy it. So far, we have over 40 influencers contributing their work. And we're looking for more to make our solution much more powerful. We have identified six areas we think are very important to influence a consumer's choice when it comes to decide which food. Some of those requires a lot of expert solution input. We want to uh, reach out to the people in this room, in Citizen Chips, who are developing those kind of solutions. Because I think it is time to bring all those segmented learnings together in one platform to offer consumers the actionable um, choices they could make. And in the end, if you share our view and want to help people eat better in a practical and accessible way, please come and find me. We are in S42. Say hi or have a cup of coffee. And uh, my name is Shan Shan. Thank you very much. Buonasera. Um, I will speak something like Italian English, something like this. Well, I am uh, an expert of gluten free, a gluten free market, and um, this is the gluten free case because this is the case where um, food is actually the medicine. Uh, what is gluten? Mm, normally, we, mm, we have made a research, nobody knows exactly what gluten is. Uh, gluten doesn't exist, really. It's a combination of, of some proteins. I, uh, there are two proteins involved that with water and energy made something that's like a rete, a wire, uh, um, net that is very elastic and gives to the dough of bread or especially bread or uh, cakes elastici elasticity and softness. So this is gluten. And gluten is almost everywhere because gluten is also used by the food industry to make something thick. For example, in uh, ketchup, there is gluten. Oh, for example, I was amazed when I uh, done the search. There is a mayonnaise. There is in, in uh, sausage, in, um, in ham, in something that shouldn't be. And gluten is the medicine for some specific uh, co uh, health condition. The celiac disease is the first condition. And the celiac disease is an autoimmune um, uh, disease that causes damages to the intestine. I don't know if the pronunciation is correct, but uh, it's the part of the, our stomach. <laughs> it uh, uh, destroys some um, part of the, uh, that part that we absorb the nutrients. The other th um, condition is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And this is a strange case because people who suffer of this condition don't have a really a real test that prove that they have this kind of disease. So they have to, they go to a large and a uh, stressful um, process to have the diagnosis. But there is, uh, this we, they make a, it's called gluten challenge. So they 
eat gluten and then they don't eat gluten and in the between doctors measure the, um, the condition. Then there is weight allergies. It's, uh, it's like every allergy, it's a, a, a immediate answer of the body to the um, uh, allergen. And gluteotaxin is the other autoimmune disorder. There are other um, conditions that uh, now is uh, demonstrated that with, if we take off the gluten, people get better. And um, there are many studies, and uh, Alessio Fasano is an Italian doctor who is studying in uh, the United States all these kind of conditions. But these are the only cases that people can not eat gluten. In, this is, in these cases, gluten is the cure, gluten is a medicine. And in Italy, the National Health Service um, have, um, give to people with the, with the celiac disease a bonus for to buy medicine, to buy food, actually, because food is the drug, food is the medicine. So select uh, people can buy food for free. The problem is, is the gluten-free diet healthy? Uh, not necessary. Actually, is Mm, not, because many of the um, gluten-free pro products are full of starches, full of sugars, preservatives, and are very, very poor of fiber. So we treat a condition, but we generate other problems. And uh, the challenge is to have, as Dr. Graham said before, a balanced diet. But what is a balanced diet? That's the problem. Is celiac disease increasing? Yes, it apparently is increasing. Uh, we have uh, the national, the annual report of the parliament of celiac disease uh, demonstrate that the disease is increasing but we don't know actually why he's increasing. Because the first thing we can think is we have more diagnosis. Uh, the diet is changed in, over the years. We, since the second world, we are eating gluten over and over and over. We start gl eating gluten from breakfast. We eat gluten at uh, lunch. At dinner, we, for, uh, for a snack, we actually are eating gluten all over the day. And uh, uh, also antibiotics could have some, uh, some um, consequences on the microbiome of uh, all the intestines in, uh, in this could cause an increase of sick disease. And, but really, we don't have an answer to this kind of, of data. There are clinical evidences. We have uh, people with celiac disease as a genetic predisposition, first of all. Then mm, there are studies that are demonstrated that Celiac with genetic, with the uh, uh, celiac disease have a leaky gut, so the permeability, inter intestinal permeability, that cause a kind of uh, troubles you know, for health. And again, high exposure to gluten. Uh, we really, we are um, really eating a lot of product with, uh, with bleached 
with. And uh, so it can cause some troubles to, uh, to our health. And stress, stress too, it can be another of the causes of the silica, degree, uh, silica increase. Uh, another mm, motivation or reason could be that the wheat were modified in, in uh, the last years, but there is no an evidence, a real evidence of this. Uh, most of the of the um, uh, baked products that we eat are made with creso. Creso is a, a wheat, a grain that is a some kind of uh, hybridation with the other um, uh, wheat in the, that are, have been treated with uh, uh, irradiation of neutrons and gamma rays. So it's kind of <laughs> a strange thing. But uh, most of people could say that this is, can be a, a real problem, but it's not proved. Is gluten free a trend? Yes, it is. It's also a trend, a fashion. Uh, we are all gluten free. And it's, it's a problem because it's, um, there is a confusion between the need of it gluten free and the trend, if the free diet. Uh, we have a lot of day diet, uh, alkaline, paleo, ketogenic, and we don't know exactly what to do. And there is something that is called orthorexia nervosa. People are afraid to eat. As, again, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. It's a long, it's an ancient uh, uh, wisdom and, uh, but because we have also this kind of fear of food too. We are fear to be poisoned at last. Um, and uh, we have also this kind, but the kind of dilemma, it's all just for the richest part of the world, of the people. The um, uh, people that don't have access to food, don't have this kind of dilemma. They just eat what can, every food we can, can, can get. Uh, a food is a symbol, a culture, a swinging trend between health and pleasure. It's, just, it's, uh, um, it's difficult to change the way of eating. For, a, for an Italian, it's different to renounce to pasta and pizza. We in, in Italy, we have the most the, mm, better gluten-free products, I think, because we cannot live without pasta and pizza and bread. It's our culture. And uh, in, uh, uh, there are always a strange contrast between hunger and abundance. And this is, uh, I think, the real problem. I, I have some example here, but I, I think that I have uh, run, on, run out of time. Because when we find solution, alternative solution to wheat, for example, and we are going to find uh, mm, cereals, Alterna alternative seal like quinoa, for example, we made some we made some kind of mm, trouble in the in Bolivia, for example, where the fever for quinoa has uh, created some problems at social level because uh, um, it was a cereal that native people were eating from many many years. And uh, now they are not eating any more quinoa. They are eating junk food, really junk food, and because all the quinoa is sells to the richest part of the country. So the problem is also, yes, food is a medicine. Food is 
the drug, food can heal us, but which, at what cost, at what, uh, to whom, at uh, uh, who is going to eat well. Because so the challenge is to have health, food, uh, sustainability. This is, I can't pronounce this in, 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 uh, in English well. And uh, I think uh, that it's a really important word and it should be pronounced well. Uh, this is, I, I worked for also for I Cook For You, and uh, this is our solution to bring a healthy uh, lunch and dinner to people with a problem with intolerance. Uh, we made meals and we delivered it, uh, them to people with intolerance. But that's all. And uh, I think this a problem, real problem is just what I have said, I've said before, is uh, to find a balance between all uh, the aspect uh, of making food, eating food, and choosing food for all the world, for all the people, uh, without difference and rich and poor. That's all. Thank you. everyone. I am so, so excited to be here at Season Chips and to be here in Milano. This is like a dream come true for me, so I am thrilled to be here. And my name is Haley Thomas. I am 17 years old. I'm a health activist, the CEO of the Happy Organization. I'm also, uh, most recently, the youngest certified integrative nutrition health coach in the United States. Now, I am so thrilled to represent the next generation of food leaders, as truly we can't even talk about the future of food without considering who's going to take over next. And so I'm thrilled to share a little bit about my journey and the work that we do to activate and empower the next generation of food leaders. So my story truly started with my dad. And this is me and my little sister. Shout out to my sister in the crowd here. And coming from a super Jamaican family, food has always been something that is integrated in our culture at home. We always love cooking, but we never considered the fact that food truly does have an impact beyond just flavor. And this is when everything changed for our entire family and our perspective on food in general. My dad was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and I can remember vividly when we came back from the doctor's office, sitting in the car with my parents and my mom going through the list of side effects on the medication that the doctor had prescribed. It was things as mild as headaches and dizziness and diarrhea, upset stomach, to internal bleeding and even death. And so hearing this as just an eight-year-old in this process, I was absolutely terrified and I had no idea why someone who is always promoted as there to help you and to heal you was trying to kill my dad. So I felt personally insulted by this medication, but I also didn't understand why that was the supposed solution. And so because I have a very Jamaican family and a very, ex a very expansive mindset within our family, we didn't take the medication at face value. We figured there was, has to be another alternative, a different solution, and so my mom really dug deep into the problem, seeing what causes type 2 diabetes and how that impacts the body, and ultimately we discovered that food is both the cause and potentially the cure. Through this process, I learned so much, and even though I was scared, the best part about this was that m my sister and I, she was only four, I was only eight at the time, were in fully involved in the process of learning about food and learning about reading labels and GMOs and pesticides and factory farming and everything in between. There was no sugar coating. We literally learned everything there was about the food system. And I was honestly extremely shocked. I couldn't believe that 
none of my peers at school even knew about these things or that it wasn't mandatory for us to learn about this in school in general. And learning all this, we decided to take action and put it in the work. So we, for a year, really dedicated our lives to making sure that we were eating healthier, swapping out ingredients for better ones, testing out different recipes. Instead of heavy white rice and sauces, we loved doing lettuce wraps and just mixing it up and having fun. And the one thing I remember about this experience was that I didn't even focus on the fact that we were trying to heal this huge disease, but more the fun, engagement, and exciting process of seeing my dad getting better. And with all of this effort, we were able to completely reverse his condition within just a year, not even pre-diabetic, but completely off of medication, not even having to use it, just having these lifestyle changes. And so with this powerful transformation within our family, I truly started to realize the power of food. It was beyond flavor as, again, my family totally looked at food. We would go to food festivals and just eat everything there, not consciously uh, being aware of really what that does in our bodies. And so with that, I realized the power of food and its healing abilities. And so I questioned, again, why, why aren't my peers learning about this? this feels wrong. I have a healthy, happy family here still to this day, but there are millions and millions of kids and families who aren't educated and aren't equipped with the knowledge to heal themselves and to enjoy that process. And so with that and these very daunting and upsetting facts, I was angry and I felt like every kid should know what's in their food, where it comes from, how it grows, and then how to utilize healthy ingredients in their own homes. And so with that, I had to do something. And again, I was like 10 at this point. I have no idea what do something even meant. I just knew I really, really, really wanted to help any, anybody else dealing with an issue, anybody else who wanted to learn about food. And so with that, I went to my mom. We talked about some possible solutions, and I joined an organization that gave youth platform to speak about health and well-being in their communities. And that is truly the platform that just made an entire ripple effect of incredible opportunities for me to share my voice in different arenas and health sectors at conferences just like this. This photo you see here um, is actually my very first speech ever, not the one with Michelle Obama, but I was 10 at the time, I just started, and I had no idea that my voice was powerful or I was even capable of delivering this information and being respected. And the best thing about this experience was that I was. And again, I started to think, this is, this is the power of young people. We can actually transfer these messages. And so that's what I appreciate about having the Teenovators here and being able to have this platform and seeing the movement grow and expand into bringing in younger people. But I continue to have incredible opportunities to speak and do different TV shows and things like that in America, getting to introduce First Lady Michelle Obama at the uh, Healthy Lunchtime Challenge Kids State Dinner. And truly all of these experiences were amazing. I was getting my message out there, but I wasn't making that direct impact that truly changed my family's life, which was with hands-on nutrition education, something that was fun and didn't feel like the horrifying statistics that we go through day to day in the health industry. So now at this point, how can I possibly empower healthier generations? I'm already speaking, but I don't know about going into a community. Like, I'm not even old enough to have a business. So what can I do about this? So with that, I co-founded with my mom the HAPPY organization. HAPPY is standing for Healthy, Active, Positive, Purposeful Youth. And through our programs, we teach plant-based nutrition and culinary education to kids in underserved communities all across the U.S. And the great thing about this is that we truly focus on getting into these schools and getting into communities that really need this information and are systematically predisposed to unhealthy lifestyles and not even access to this information. So we do immersive summer cooking camps, we do nutrition classes and school pop-ups, and the whole idea is for kids just to love and understand fruits and vegetables and not at the surface level of it's good for you, which we hear from a lot of health teachers in school or from our parents even, just eat it like it's good for you. That's not enough. And so we let them know that this is for brain power and you can eat this for protein so that you can be active and healthy and strong. 
And so through this process, it's all about educating and empowering through these things and being specific and truly shedding light on the food system as it is and how they can take steps to improve their health and well-being in their families. I don't know why there's a line on skills, <laughs> but ultimately, through our programs and through everything we do, they ha enjoy food, they have fun, they get to learn together, they work on teamworking skills, they have creative expression. During our summer camps, it's m one of the most fun things ever. We have an entire pantry of spices, and my family, we are like spice hoarders, so this was amazing to bring like all these spices to these kids and just let them have at it. We would bring vegetables and tell them like season it the way you'd like to see it. And they would literally mix every single <laughs> spice there was. You'd see basil and cumin and coriander and you would also see some cinnamon in there and just seeing them have those creative juices flowing while thinking about how they can tailor healthy eating to their taste buds was truly an amazing experience. But Ultimately, you get all these skills while you're learning about how to eat healthfully. And that's the most fun thing ever. Now, this is Macy, and this is one of my favorite stories from our summer camps. I remember her very, very vividly because she came into our first camp with a huge bag of, like, Skittles and gummy bears and chocolate as her breakfast. And, of course, we were very observant of this, kind of making sure that, you know, she was okay. Was she getting even breakfast at home? And ultimately, we just discovered, you know, she doesn't like eating healthy. She's scared of trying different foods. And after our week-long camp and after she had told us she was allergic, to sweet potatoes, we actually converted her to a sweet potato lover and someone who actually wanted to be in the kitchen, loved making smoothies, and enjoyed eating healthily. And by the end of the camp, she was no longer bringing in these sugary drinks or sugary products and other things because she was aware of just what that impact is on her body. So ultimately, what I have learned throughout this journey and what I want you all to take away from this, especially for the, the next generation of food leaders, is that peer-to-peer -peer connection is truly invaluable. Having young people talk to young people about this issue is something that is so powerful that I've experienced, and I truly don't even know how to describe it, but when you can connect to a peer in that experience, it truly amplifies the message and makes it feel so much more special. So including young people in the work that you're doing and, and having that opportunity is so very important. Another thing is that intergenerational support because it helps us collectively create positive and lasting change. And this is across all sectors in the world, but especially through health, we're supporting each other's new ideas and old ideas and combining these forces together, we can truly make a difference. And young people actually do want to be involved in the issues that shape our world and concern our futures. So usually it's kind of like my generation has a stereotype of always being on our phones and taking selfies and not caring about anything. And that truly holds us back. That stereotype holds us back from unleashing our potential, finding out what we love to do, and actually being involved in causes that matter. So including us and lifting the labels and limitations that or perceptions you may have on our generation also helps to create a space of collaboration. And finally, Good nutrition fuels our potential and gives us the energy and vitality to live up to it. So knowing that whatever we fuel the very vessel that pushes us forward with, we will be able to ultimately reach our goals and dreams. And this is especially important when talking to the younger generations. So with that said, I don't know why that's messed up, but <laughs> I hope you join us in empowering healthier generations. You can connect with us on social media, I love posting recipes on at Haley Thomas and at the Happy Org shares all about our work that we do across the U.S. And we are currently working on programs to expand beyond the U.S. So we'd love to connect with you all. But thank you for listening to my story and for listening to my generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. That was an awesome presentation there. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen, here in uh, Milano, a great city of sports and of nutrition as well. And uh, 
I'm happy to bring along with you a little view on the future of nutrition and then targeting the personalized nutrition and especially picking up the uh, topic of sports and nutrition. And I think we're all lacking a little bit of physical activity at this moment, but that's the way it is. So yeah, bear with me and uh, maybe some uh, physical activity comes uh, later on. Um, I will like to uh, yeah, bring you some slides on this and then uh, that will be very instrumental in further explaining you <laughs> what we will be discussing uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, but uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Jeroen Wouters. I'm an uh, innovation manager in sports and nutrition at the Dutch Olympic Training Facilities. And I'm also uh, working at Food Valley NL, a Dutch uh, innovation organization. And in the presentation, I would like to bring out one important topic, and that is the combination with sports and physical activity. Um, could the organizers say whether there's a presentation coming up or? Okay, it should be in the system. Now then I will explain you by heart here what uh, the main items are. And what we did at the Sports uh, Olympic uh, Training Center is that we said, well, uh, there's a lot of sports activity. People would like to excel. These are the best of the Dutch athletes. And they also indicated, uh, let's make nutrition our key topic there. And with that in mind, we said, well, we need to join forces. We have to collaborate and bring out the different expertises that are required. So that sports medical, it's the coach, it's the cook, it's the um, uh, dietitian, and they all team up. And in my role as more bit of a uh, scientific background, we set up a different system to that. So the multidisciplinarity, we have heard that before, is a key topic in that uh, guidance and support. Then next to that, we said, well, you can maybe look at three items. There's a lot of items now in biomarkers and analyzing what is uh, going on with uh, 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 a healthy and sporty individual. Uh, a lot of things are being analyzed. I'm also using uh, two uh, watches and counting my steps, etc. But much more data is being generated on sports and nutrition. And we said, well, there is a lot of nice products out there. And we have been focusing a lot on proteins. You have heard that topic uh, today as well. And the main message for the athletes is 20 grams of protein 20 minutes after exercise. And by using that, you can already indicate and easily learn the large group of Dutch athletes. It's about 500 uh, athletes training at our sports center that uh, the role of protein in recovery is very important. And we said, well, that is important for athletes Head training, but it's also much more important for the multidisciplinary approach. Also bring that to less physical active people, also bring it to schools, and also bring it into a medical setting. So we have combined those uh, aspects to it. And then we said, well, there is dietary coaching. And dietary coaching, of course, very much involved in uh, behavior of, of individuals. And for that, we set up an iPhone application. All the 500 athletes, they have a dietary uh, intake and they eat at our sports facility. I had very nice pictures on that. But uh, and they eat and they eat breakfast, lunch and dinner. And intermediately they have sports nutrition topics and food products. That is all monitored throughout the day. And the athlete can uh, look at its phone. Finally, there's a good reason to look at the phone. And they can monitor what is the different intake in macronutrients. Yeah, protein, uh, carbohydrates, fats, but also very many of the micronutrients that are maybe of specific interest, iron, vitamin B12, etc., vitamin D. And you can monitor how the da daily recommendations are being met. That is also being uh, made uh, fine-tuned based on the physical activity per day. So if it's a resting day, the daily values are a bit lower, and when it's a very active sports day, the daily values are being raised. And so can everyone eh, look at their own, own sports discipline, but also look at the daily activity, where the balance should be between food intake and uh, basically the physical activity. So we help the young athletes to, to learn and to utilize that. And with that, the third item of dietary coaching is also very much covered. Um, 
yeah, that means that yeah, with that combination, we can assist the coaches. We can see very remarkable items because we help the coaches, uh, the athletes, and we can also say, well, hey, protein intake at a certain time is maybe low, so spread that throughout the day. And for example, have some protein moment, as we now refer to it, at the end of the evening, rather, eh, prior to sleeping, and have some additional uh, benefits from that in recovery processes. So we assist in that, and what is also fun to address one of the items is that we compared the food intake of this population, eh, the athletes at the Papendal Training Center, with the regular Dutch population, and you see a much higher intake of uh, uh, carbohydrates as well as uh, proteins, but a much lower uh, intake of, um, of fat. And we could basically deduce that because of the high quantity of uh, vegetable intake and vegetable consumption. And we uh, trigger that to serve out cups of vegetables rather than having the athletes choose their own, uh, own uh, size and quantity of uh, vegetables. So by providing that, we assist them also in that respect. Now, key items there is that uh, personalized nutrition approaches are being uh, followed, biomarkers are being analyzed, a lot of nice products, it's a lot of about proteins, different sources, it can be vegetable, it can be uh, animal-based, but uh, the variety is key in that, and then the uh, uh, nutritional coaching in, the, in that respect, and that all with a multidisciplinary team. I would like to thank you for that, uh, a little bit of different uh, presentation than anticipated, but thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Massimo, I'm the founder of a couple of startups making food with insects um, uh, in China and in Thailand. And uh, let me please start with a brief video of one, one minute and we will talk about that um, from here, I guess. Yes. Do you have the audio, please? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Try the um, the curly Q one first, the spiral. Is there it's anything fine. on the pasta, no. or is it just a uh, no, little bit of olive oil and some salt? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. It tastes like homemade food. Want to try? It's not bad. It's it's fine. Now, now try the other one. Is Chief Big Pussy Face going to have a Well, the, the, the pasta is being monopolized what? by both sides. Yeah, how did I know you were talking to me? <laughs> I don't know, but you answered me right away. Now try the one that looks like spaghetti. <laughs> which one do you like better? You know which one I actually uh, like better, and I think I know that it's the cricket one. Which, Which one? one? They're all for the good. spiral. Oh, yeah. I, I like the, I like the regular. We'll go with uh, Charlie's. I like, I like the, the spiral one. This is a little crunchy. You I know like what? You know what better. this one is? I think this is gluten-free pasta. The um, linguine. The uh, I think the linguine. It's surprisingly is. delicious. The twisty one that you like so much is cricket pasta. I knew it. Yeah, it was it's fine. It's called a bug salutely, and um, it's 20% crickets uh, ground up. It says on the box, uh, contains 20% cricket flour, a superfood that's rich in proteins, omega-3, and vitamin B12. <laughs> now, the interesting thing of this is, I, I didn't know about this. We found out because the website, website had, a, had a peak in visits, and we found out that they, they bought the cricket pasta somewhere. Uh, it's in the U.S. It's a na national uh, radio show. And um, the interesting part uh, is that the reaction of most of the people um, is, is this, the first try, in, they try insects, they say it, it doesn't taste insects. So this to me is, says a lot about the preconception uh, people have with, with, with eating insects. Uh, they, they think that because we don't eat insects, in the insects taste bad, and then they are surprised they don't. Um, the, the problem with, with this taste with insects is, is clearly only in uh, uh, North America and Europe, because in most of the other countries and in all the continents, um, um, insects are, are eaten. Um, now, you, you, I'm sure you have, you have heard about edible insects, because media coverage in the West in the last uh, few years has been huge and uh, uh, has tried to uh, tell people that there are reasons to eat insects um, and, and we will see what, what these reasons are. Um, but first, let me finish with, with the problem of this taste. There is no reason to think that insects are, are, are um, um, 
disgusting. Uh, I don't see any difference, uh, visual difference, or, or even that the similarity between shrimps and crickets is, is, they are so close that if you are allergic to shrimps, there are good chances you are allergic also to crickets. Um, in, in that other um, photo, you have uh, uh, silkworms and, and, and again shrimps, but even an oyster to me looks, looks like a monster, um, but we, we like to eat oysters. So clearly, clearly there is a preconception um, with, with eating insects. Um, but, and this is the reason why for centuries we haven't considered that as a food. Um, but a few years ago, uh, someone started making food with insects, uh, maybe as it's like in the case of the lollipop, which is a successful um, U.S. Uh, companies. It's kind of a joke. It's, it's not really food. Uh, or in the case of Jiminy's, which is a French startup, um, in, uh, as a whole insects as a snack, which is the traditional way to do that. And in my opinion, it's not the way to go when it comes to Western consumers. Uh, but then someone started uh, integrating the insects in, in, in packaged food in a, in a, in a better way. Uh, and then a lot of startups in uh, the US and, and U in Europe too um, decided that maybe it's better to start from a niche, which is fitness. And, and, and so there are so many uh, brands doing energy bars now where the percentage of cricket powder um, is, is not huge, I have to say, because it's still expensive. Um, but it's a first step and, and maybe it's, it's, it's a good idea to start from fitness, who, who may know. But I prefer, I prefer to consider um, farmed insects, because here we are talking about farmed insects, so they're, they're absolutely safe. Um, like like somef something you process into powder and then you use as an ingredient uh, to make, to make a uh, food as we know, we, which may, may be the pasta, like in the case of our, my startup in, in Thailand, where cricket flour cost four, less, four times less than in the US and, and eight times less than in Europe, um, or like meat, like in the case of these uh, Belgian uh, companies, which is an established food companies, or, or, or Bologna sauce, and some of you are Italians, I'm sure, so you will smile at this, but it tastes good, what can I say? And, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you, you'll get used to this, I'm sure. Um, so in Thailand, there is definitely an advantage um, in, in, um, in uh, um, buying the ingredient, because farming, farming uh, uh, cricket is, is a tradition that started long, long ago. Um, but I also, as I mentioned before, I'm also working at a project, and we will go into production, with Baxolutli China, making the first snack um, made with uh, uh, silkworm powder. Uh, I was invited by a food accelerator. Um, the president of this food accelerator um, has been on this stage this morning. Uh, is the first Chinese food accelerator focused on sustainability and uh, on uh, health food. Um, and they invited me to work on this project. And, and we are now in the later stages. Um, um, the advantages with silkworm uh, is, is that uh, they are already farmed uh, since 4,000 years ago in China, and, and they are a bypass product. Uh, they are fed on a, on mulberry, only on, with mulberry leaves, um, so it's a perfect circular economy because you just get the, the, the leaves from, from the mulberry trees, and they, they don't need water, um, they are perfectly clean, um, and, and there are tons of them which are used mostly in China for, for, uh, for feed for animals. So you have a superfood, which is the silkworm, and you give that to uh, other animals um, to get a lot less meat and a less healthy meat. In terms of nutrition, I, as I said, this is a superfood. Um, so uh, it can, it's packed with protein, so that's why someone talk about um, insect protein. Um, I prefer to call them edible insects because it's not just the protein. Uh, there are a lot of minerals, and there are a lot of vitamins, um, so it's much more than that. And uh, in terms of sustainability, 
maybe this is not something that can influence too much the consumer decisions when they purchase a food, uh, but it's something we, we, we innovators know it, it's really important. I mean, the insects are fantastic, you know, they convert, they convert feed into, into body mass in a very efficient way, while we, we all know that uh, beef is, is an ecological disaster. Uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, legal status, um, what I call Anglo-Saxon countries, um, uh, they don't have a problem with farmed insects at all. So you can produce them, you can sell them in supermarkets. While Europe, they, they, they make kind of complicated process. Uh, we know that Europe can be bureaucratic sometimes and, and uh, uh, I expect uh, crickets and mealworm to finish the approval process which started in January 2018 uh, within the end of the year or the beginning of 2019. Uh, legal obstacle and, and regula regulatory uncertainty is not good for business. So Europe in terms of innovation, food innovation, as an obstacle when, 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 when getting approval from the EU is so complicated. Now, um, I, I didn't update this slide with the latest survey, uh, which is even more optimistic than this. Uh, this is going to be a huge market, um, especially in north of Europe. Uh, maybe in Italy, I noticed more people uh, complaining about the idea of eating insects, but they didn't taste them. So we should try from first. We should taste them and, and see if, if they taste good or not. And then I think, because that's the most important thing with food, right? So um, if you want to know more, you can check out the uh, um, website about cricket pasta or the Chinese one is, is about the um, um, silkworm flour based chips. And you, you can contact me anytime to get inform more information. Thank you.